Dave Nelson. My name is Rebecca Nichols. I'll be moderating this. I just want to welcome you here today. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Oh, my our pleasure. Um, uh, we want to start out and, and know a little bit about you. Um, where were you born? I was born in Seattle, Washington. Okay, and... Uh, many years ago. Many years ago. Um, you can tell us when, if you like, or not. Uh, 1943. Yeah, I okay. was a, a war baby. All oh, right. Um, your parents, what were their names? Leo and Helen. And what kind of work did your mother or your father do? Uh, they're both from Wyoming, and uh, my father uh, was a pilot. Oh. He was a cargo pilot up in Alaska during the war, and so United Airlines uh, took all those guys because they were already trained and hired them on. Oh, wow, that makes war. sense. Yeah. yeah. And um, you then, uh, your family, uh, when, after you were born, uh, you moved to San Francisco? You moved to Bay Area? Yeah, we got in the car and drove out. I kind of remember it, too. I was only about three years old, but uh, uh, I remember long drives in the night and, and going across the Mississippi River. Wow. Because I think we were coming from Chicago at the time. Right. And uh, But we moved to Redwood City, a little place uh, which I don't remember, but then away some back to Seattle maybe for a while and then uh, and then before school just before I started school we came back to, and moved into San Mateo did, did you have any uh, brothers or sisters sister what was her name yeah, her sister name? Terry Terry yeah. um, is she musical at all or artistic no no um, my dad was really what in what way he used to play harmonica and play guitar and you can and, and stuff great things you have music from a young age when yeah you picked up an acoustic guitar and the play yeah it. in those days uh, parents would it was pretty common for parents to get the kid uh, a record album which consisted of 78s sure in a, in a booklet you know that you fold these brown envelopes you know right and mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, uh, Tex Ritter's songs and stories <laughs> And hop along Cassidy and, and some stuff like that. But I also had, uh, you know, the Nutcracker Suite and Peter and the Wolf narrated narrated by Basil Rathbone. That was a trip. About how old were you when you were? Doing From these? as long as I can remember. I mean, probably when I was one, they started doing this. Wow. Yeah, Amazing. I remember sitting in front of the magnet box, and one time I was listening to. I'd have my mom put the records on, you know, but. Uh, I was listening to my dad's Burl Ives folk songs and I was <laughs> teething at the time I was cutting teeth and the cardboard edge of the album was just perfect, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that gets it, you know. So I was listening to music and I'm going like that. That's wonderful. And That's almost wonderful. lost my privileges. Wonderful. And when chewed you, up the album. <laughs> when you were going to school, did uh, you ever, were you ever in music classes or did you ever... You continue your now, music. Well, uh, there was a time in, in school, in grade school, when uh, in about the second grade, when uh, I, saw, I was coming home from school and I saw a guy getting out of a car with a big black guitar case, and which I was really wanting, you know, I was, I was really interested in that. And uh, I'd only seen one once before at a friend's house. He said his uncle was here and he had a guitar and we ran in there pulled it out from under the bed and I strummed the strings and went, uh oh, this is gonna be hard because it didn't make music right away, you know. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't, like the open tuning, right. chromatic tuning. But anyway, I'd only seen that for a guitar and uh, the guy comes up to my house and I ran up and and he's telling my parents that I could could be enrolled in uh, guitar classes. And he takes out this guitar, which is an acoustic guitar. But what I didn't know, I was too little to realize, it's a steel guitar. It had the strings raised up, so you can't play it like this. No. And I was saying, yes, to my parents, yes, I want to do that. And they were saying, okay, and, and let me show you how your son can play now. And they put it on my lap. And I'm going, oh, well, maybe you start this way, and then when you get good, you can right. <laughs> play it this way. And he'd pick, you know, and he'd hold the bar, and I'd strum. It works out okay, and I was, yeah, but I still it's not what I really was just too little to say, hey, you know, I didn't, what What do you say? Right. You know, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so I got roped into these lessons, 
And then once you're roped into it, you can't really quit. Right. Especially if you're good. And I hated being good. Right. <laughs> because that means you're going to be promoted into classes with older kids. Doing the same thing. And they thing. all snicker when you come in. A little shrimpy guy comes in with his music, you know. Right. And so I really didn't like that at all. And it was not any kind of music that I could relate to. Right. But some of that steel guitar and helps you later on. And my mom asked me to and stuff like that. But I remember poignant times with the, uh, the bridge club saying, yes, play something. And I'd be sitting there, oh, <laughs> what time I was playing this deal. And I was just thinking, God, I don't want to do this. A tear, a tear went like, onto oh the my guitar. God. <laughs> you paid your dues. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, it went I, to I, a real I, guitar in your Yeah, life. so, so I, that went on for years. And, and uh, then finally I said, uh, if I promise to go get sheet music every now and then and learn a tune, will you let me quit with the lessons? They said, okay. And that guitar went as far back in the closet as I could get it. You know? <laughs> and then just a couple of years after that, I'm in high school and Peter Alvin. Uh, My good friend, yeah. Yeah. As was in, he was a year younger than me, but he was in art class. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, uh, his brother just got back from Mexico and brought a guitar. Want to come over and learn? And I said, this kind of guitar? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I'll be right over. We were just, <laughs> that's, that's it. I just practiced until my fingers were bloody. Then you and Peter used to practice a little together? Was Peter yeah, Rodney right would show us then? stuff sure. and then Peter showed me chords. And I'd borrow a guitar and, and here and there and then finally got one. Uh, you know. That's great. It's just, yeah. that. The uh, rest is history. Yeah, yeah and really it was like, why didn't I think of that earlier? Right. You know, well, you're young. I'm big now. I can get. I can get one. I, I can, can have one. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I know what to ask for. So there you are, graduating high school. You're finishing high school. Yeah, and Peter, that brings us to the thing. I, uh, I really attribute it to Peter's older brother, Rodney. Uh, uh, is <laughs> to the the whole connection between the scene, the peninsula, and everything. Sure. Because uh, he had this idea uh, uh, for a, a place that we could play, but it wouldn't be like, you know, you ask money for it or anything, but it would just be us, you know, right. but it would be like a place. It would be a real sound system and a stage. And he got uh, Mr. Houchin's bookstore in, in uh, San Carlos to loan us the store, be upstairs with a balcony every Tuesday and Thursday night in the summer. And we called it the Boar's Head. You know, we made up kind of some kind of a sign like out of Shakespeare, the sure. boar's head, you know. And uh, I swear that was just, that just, that idea was just fantastic. Right. Everybody had something to contribute. Everybody had, you know, something they could do or some shtick of some sort, you sure. know. And then one day Rodney comes up to me and Peter and says, come on, we're going down to Kepler's bookstore. We're going to find some of those beatniks down there, the Kepler's crowd, you know, they all hang out. And I was saying, I know, yeah, I go there and do stuff. And he said, yeah, those people, you know. Tell them there's a party. And there's this guy named Jerry Garcia who's sometimes there. And I remember thinking, geez, haven't I heard that before? But I couldn't have because he hadn't played a gig yet. Or right, there right. wasn't any such thing. Before the Warlocks. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. Before, before the Black Mountain Boys. Before That's right. Either. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's just to, one of those things, you know. So Charisma, we, did you, whatever we, you did call you it. play together? But yeah, we, we, we went, we drove down there. And me and Peter peeking through the books, you know, that's him, there he is. And I see this really hairy guy uh, with his shirt open and playing a 12 string with this really intense look on his face, really surly, you know, like, sure. like that, you know. And uh, quietly playing his 12 string. And uh, we go over, Ronnie shoves us up there, you know, and says, uh, these are my friends, David and Pete, and we want to have this thing called the Boar's Head. And I had a banjo, or if Rodney had a banjo, puts a banjo in my hands, and I'm all of a sudden sitting there playing, you know. Didn't have time to think about it or anything. But uh, so anyway, Garcia said, yeah, he'd come down there. And, and, How uh, old were you all right about then? I was 18. 18. Just turned 18, or maybe 17. It was either the summer of 60 or the summer of 61. Right. Uh, but uh, that one night when he... Uh, it showed up with all these people, all these freaks, you know. 
was just really one of the greatest ever. I mean, he did. Uh, Never talk about it later. Country. <laughs> uh, um, some songs he still did, you know. Uh, Peggy O. Mm -hmm. Did that song. And it's, it's funny, I just wrote an article about this for Relics Magazine. That's why it's fresh in my mind. Right. But yeah. Um, it's a great story. Yeah, and then we went on to, uh, this, the thing got gathered more momentum and more, more and more, and we'd have parties afterwards. And Pigpen, that's how Pigpen got, came on the scene. This well, young he kid named Ron McKernan from Palo Alto. Nobody knew him. He was just outrageous looking. He had the perfect rock and roll, jelly roll haircut. You know, I mean, perfect. And just uh, amazing looking. And your face just really beat up by acne, you know, years. And, and uh, kind of a quiet yeah. demeanor, you He's know. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. And, uh, and then he would sit down and play and sound like Lightning Hopkins or somebody. It was just like amazing. Everybody was drop jawed. Who is this guy? You know, well, it was Ron McKernan, you know, from Palo Alto. His father's a DJ, so he's had access to all that obscure blues stuff all his life. And we were just like, wow, that is totally amazing. Right. He would play all the time. I remember the night he got his nickname, too. Tell we were all rumbling that. out on the street after the thing wondering where to go because Susie Wood's parents were home and we couldn't have a party there <laughs> at her house. So everybody's going, well, you know, somebody suggested something. No, I don't want to go there. That's too far. And so we're dividing up into little factions, you know, of where they were going to go. And somebody said, Pigpen said, why don't you all just drop it all and just go on over to uh, this other place that people had nixed for some reason or other. And Sherry Huddleston turned around and went, oh, Pigpen, you're always saying something like that. She just said it spontaneously because the Pigpen and the Peanuts comment. Sure, sure, sure. Stuff, you know, was, so she was, was referring to it. Everybody that. read it in those days. Yeah. And everybody just turned around and went, Pigpen. And I saw him looking like, oh, God, that's going to stick. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just kind of know it, you know. Exactly. So right about right about this time, um, uh, hanging out more in the East Bay and coming back into San Francisco. No, this was Palo Alto. This was right. San Carlos and Palo Alto, and then the East Bay, because I went to art school at uh, gotcha. California College of Arts and Crafts. So you're an artist as well. That next yeah, the year after I graduated. What and, kind uh, of what kind of medium do you? Oh, well, mostly most commonly I draw and. Uh, and uh, oils was my favorite thing. Oh, wow. Because Jerry was in art school. Yeah. About yeah. that same period, too. Yeah. Know, as well. And um, when, uh, I want to bring us to, uh, when do you do you feel you played your first show? The first show was a uh, thing organized by Pete Alvin, um, where it was going to be the CSM Folk Festival at uh, College of San Mateo. And, uh, but we had a, that's right, we had a thing in the afternoon, it was an a art gallery opening at San Francisco State, but somebody knew Jerry and said, uh, would you do that in the afternoon for six bucks or something like that? But anyway, uh, it was me and Bob Hunter and uh, Garcia, and we were called, I think we didn't really have a name yet, so we said we're the... Thunder Mountain Tub Thumpers, formerly the Heart Valley Drifters, formerly the something. <laughs> right, something. right, right. And, uh, uh, but anyway. About what was, year are we? That was 62. About 62. Yeah. And um, uh, you continue to play with Jerry? You get, you get yeah. Freelancing? Yeah, it just and went on and on and on. Yeah, that was the CSM folk with that afternoon and then going over to San Mateo. We did... Uh, this great show, and I probably have tapes of it too. I'm going to get into that project one of these days. But totally. uh, uh, we did it in stages of the history of American music, starting out with ballads and unaccompanied stuff, right. no instruments. Jerry right. did a couple of, you know, unaccompanied ballads singing, like wow. in the real traditional style, like you and McCall or, or right. uh, one of those guys. And uh, oh, <clears throat> and then we did old string band music and. Uh, you know, where you have 
different, various configurations, sure. banjos and guitars. And Out of the South, the blues. Fiddling, yeah, and, uh, and then onto the modern day Did, form um, of traditional music, which is bluegrass. Have you, That's the living form of it. Bluegrass, yes. Yeah. And That's it's still going on now. I mean, full down stuff. And exactly. Songs that aren't necessarily traditional, but lots of them are. Right, a lot of what Grisman does. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did you guys at some point, a few years as you're growing up, ever take a walk down H Street in its full blown? I remember um, long about that. There's several, you know, moving ahead a few sure. years. There was uh, two or three years in there, which seemed like about ten actually right. in terms of the stuff that happened. Sure. Uh, like maybe ten bands, you know, different bands playing, and and, and the jug band. Uh, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, mm. and I think I thought of that name. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't admit it, only to you. Rebecca. Okay, and the rest of the but, world. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, uh, that became the the Warlocks. Okay, so they were called the, the before... Mother McCree's. Yeah, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, and we do jug band music a la uh, Jim Queskin, you know, recreation. Sure, stuff. sure. Faithful recreations of old jug band tunes, like Cam's wow. Jug Stompers and stuff like that. Wow. And this little kid came around, not little kid, but a kid like two, three years younger than us, was always hanging out and he was always kind of a pest, you know, get out, who are you? Get out of here, kid. And it was weird. Oh, and He Bobby. kept saying, no, I, I'm going to play in this band. I know I can do something. I can do something. And we thought, well, will you He's play really Jug? Young. You're right. Like, Okay, and he comes back with all kinds of different jugs. Here, what do you think of the sound of this one? You know, we were thinking, kids got pluck, you know, sign right. him up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. And I was singing it, and Dave Parker was playing uh, rub board and pig pen, of course. And uh, then I got a, a gig with this really um, high powered bluegrass band down in Los Angeles and had to go down there and played with the Pine Valley Boys for a while, and, okay. and uh, by the time I got back up here, the Jug Band had gone on to other things. Really, took no. They were, their tours were getting really intense, and right. and uh, it was great to see that there was this music was being well received. You know, totally. Did you ever play anywhere? Golden Gate Park, State Theater. Flatbed truck, anything at all during the 60s? Yeah, uh, so that's what I was 70s? leading up to. It's, it's right around that time after the jug band folded and there was just kind of hit and miss things going on and uh, there was the thought of let's, like we did at parties a lot, sure. sing old rock and roll songs. You know, we used to howl like dogs singing rock and roll stuff, you know, do wop stuff and, and laugh and laugh and laugh because rock and roll really is in a humorous vein, you know. It's it's kind of like the light porn of, of music, you know, or something. But anyway, right, it was the class of the uh, yes. Uh, there was going up to San Francisco to th these new shows, and uh, Jerry came home one night saying, it's incredible, you won't believe it, it's not like anything you've ever seen. And I think it was one of the early Fillmore shows, mm -hmm. or maybe Family Dog. Sure. But uh, he said, people are just like, all in wild, outlandish dress, you know, and and just uh, expressing themselves in any way. That's just the most outrageous thing, you know. And they all seem to be together in a funny way too, but yet not. You know? Right. And I think they're uh, cool, which meant they smoke pot. Right. Know? Right. <laughs> which was still hadn't come on above ground yet. So right. that was definitely don't ever talk about that or Friends tell anyway. anybody or anything. Yeah. Sure. Right. So you went to a concert. But, uh, so we went to one of those, and it was just like, yeah, I see what you mean. It was great. And then uh, 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 Jerry got a gig, or, or the the band, the Warlocks, started happening, practicing in one of their early, early gigs. It was more or less an audition, I think. It was at the Fillmore, and this is uh, the one Bill Graham story I have. It's true. Sure. Uh, I go in there, and they had just, in fact, for this gig, I think, they had... Uh, Changed the name to the Grateful Dead. It was a thought, you know. Let's change it to the Grateful Dead. And uh, so, but I still thought I missed the Warlock. So I go tag along, and then they said, "We got to go. I set up and everything. You can hang around here." And so I'm in the hall. Nobody's here, 
And I see a closed door, and over to the left there, it's where the bar is now. You know, mm -hmm. and I opened it up. There's this room with tables and bowls of apples on the tables, like like dining tables. And uh, so I'm, mm, yeah. And I see this guy come in, and he's got a sweatshirt and sweatpants. I thought maybe he was maintenance or something like that. It, you know, he looks at me, and I looked at him and waited for him to leave and then I took an apple, you know, and just about when I was about ready to bite into it, he comes back in, you know, and he says, uh, who are you with? And I said, uh, warlocks. And it turned out that was the one answer <laughs> that I could have said because nobody knew that the warlocks weren't built, the Grateful Dead was built. Right. If you looked at the poster, you'd have seen Grateful Dead, not right. warlocks. So he knew you so were right on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Super, yeah. super. So, um, through the years, you now bring quickly back and we'll go back and forth a little bit. Right now, you have banned the Dave Nelson band. Yeah. And uh, you've played in many bands. You've jammed with many yeah. people. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear something uh, that you'd like us to hear. So, if someone hears this, watches this tape 50 years from now. Yeah, well, I played in a band called The, the New Writers of the Purple Sage. Mm -hmm. That was the big one. Some of the people in that band? John Dawson, Dave Torbert, Buddy Cage, not Pete Sears. Not Pete, no. okay, who, who else? Oh, you are a young thing, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Spencer Dryden. And Spencer, okay. Yeah. That's who I got confused. All right. Yeah. But uh, anyway, our big hit was Panama Red, so I thought I'd do that. I'd love it. Did it for Bill many times. We can cut this out. Some of the bands you've played in, and um, you're part of this great family of music in the Bay Area. Um, I'm I'm curious right now. What do you see? Your where? What do you where do you see your life going from here on? It's just the beginning for you, David. Where? Yeah. Where? It's a long life. We wish you long. Oh, long I've been life. having great times, just jamming with more and more people. More and more people. Yeah. And do you have any dreams, any wishes you still want to do, any CDs you want to record? Aside from a million dollars and a carload of nickels? You got it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, yeah, I'd like to make lots of CDs. and uh, There's just so many things that I want to do. I want to get, uh, I want to get back into painting and drawing a lot. But, uh, oh. You know, there's just not enough time in a day sometimes. I know. I know exactly what you mean. And, but... uh, and I have a lot of other projects in mind about uh, uh, some video stuff. I've, I've got a, hours and hours of great stuff that's inside stuff, like B-roll stuff, what you call B-roll, sure, sure. making a movie, you know. It's sure. the inside stuff of the gigs. Sure. 
no gig, none of us playing because I'm playing. I'm on stage, but I bring a camera and, and shoot all the out, That's all this, stuff. the in between we'll stuff. We'll talk later. You know? Yeah, and but anyway, That's I've great. got about I've got over, you know, many hours of it. Many hours, I'd say, you know, maybe twenty or so of stuff that I'd have to sift through. You know, sure. And think about that. You know, and then I got to get the, uh, you know, the stuff transferred and and, and edited. You know, the, the the best of and stuff right. like that. We'll talk later. Yeah. On that. Right. Um, uh, writing new songs lately. Uh, yeah, it's been working on a little few things. Where uh, do you get your inspiration now? That's a good question. Uh, I collect uh, ideas just in my head, something that sounds like it's got resonance, because you can never tell. Right. It's something that's lasted many years. Is I always try to put something in a song, uh, something you know that I've been saying for a lot of years. Exactly. Or or expressions that we all used to say. You know, I remember those. That's right. <laughs> that's another one of my uh, peculiar facilities. Is I can remember stuff. Uh, from years and years ago, I mean, actually word for word stuff. But uh, uh, a lot of the songs that I write are, so we used to say certain lines from One Eyed Jacks, the cowboy movie, you know? Sure. And, uh, geez, when was that? 64 or something, something like, like that. that right? But anyway, it got to be just such a thing, part of the fabric of the right. conversation, the language. Right. You know, that I had to put that in a song. Of course. You have to. You have to. If or a true story to an event is a good place to start. A, a, a friend of yours, you know, that sure. you tell people about it. Because everybody can relate and yeah. pull what they want yeah. out of it. If uh, if you could, uh, if the world would take your advice and they'd listen, whether yeah. this tape is watched now or 50 years from now because it's going in the library, oh, yeah. what advice would you give the world? Oh, what geez. advice would you give young people? They would listen. <laughs> they seriously would listen to you. Uh, um, geez. Could be 50 one years one. from now, heaven sure. help you. Heaven help you. <laughs> yeah. God. You know? No. Uh, or, or what kept you going? I would say, what uh, kept you? So you say, you know, something really sappy like work, work hard, play hard, and mind your own business. Right. Exactly. That's what Einstein said. I don't know, that question is, I'll probably think of a great answer for Later, it. right. Later, but, maybe uh, I can phone it in. You can phone it in. Yeah, we will phone it in. File on yeah, you. Put and it on just like it comes on the phone. Exactly. Yeah, I thought of it, yeah. Exactly. Because um, I can maybe pull it out of if I said to you, if I had a big net in my hands, and I handed it to you, and you could capture any moment in your life, any moment so far, because you have great things to come, I feel it. Any moment in your life. What mm -hmm. moment in your life would you, would be a highlight for you and capture be captured? Oh, playing on Broadway is definitely one of the highlights. I'd love to, I think you brought a photo. We can yeah. close with this. We played. Oh yeah, photo. there's a, there's another Bill story about that. How that started. The, you hold the, that. The we Jerry can. Garcia acoustic band started. Just be comfortable so that you'll get it. Please you tell us the uh, story. Do you remember? That would be great. And I guess it was eighty six or or eighty five or something. Anyway, uh, Bill Graham did a did a benefit for the artists, sure. poster artists. Yes. And everybody was going to play on their only just about two or three songs, fifteen minutes tops. Right. Country Joe, everybody you know involved in the, those old days, and Jerry and John Conn were going to do a set, and uh, we had been I had been coming around with Sandy Rothman and we were playing some of the old stuff, and he said, "Why don't you guys tag along?" And so we did a set of songs, maybe three or four songs. And Bill comes running into the room after it because it was root stuff, and he's just talked as raven. He says, "I can see the the roots of the Grateful Dead stretching all the way back to this <laughs> and everything." And we're sitting on the couch. Going, That's yeah. right, Bill. That's right. You know, right. He's, he's right. He's right. Yeah. And he says, "This is this is great. I just loved hearing that. Thank you, Jerry. I've got to take this somewhere, and I don't know where." And Garcia goes, ah, "Take us to Broadway, Bill." Broadway. He backs out of the room. He goes Broadway. The next thing I hear, we're booked seventeen shows, sold out at the Lund Fontaine Theater on Broadway. Amazing. The real deal. 
That's amazing. It was amazing, yeah. You had quite a exciting cool. life. I can see this is just the beginning. I, yeah. And we're going to be asking you back, and you're going to make the time, because you have more stories that yeah, you can't capture in the yeah, short I have time. More stories than but I want to so thank you for being here and caring enough to share your life Yeah. so that piece by piece, the future will get a picture only only told by us firsthand. Yeah. To get that inspiration, to inspire, yeah. to make a better world, to make a better yeah. a better community, and that it only takes one person to follow your dream. Yeah. One day at a time to get there. That's so thank what, you. No, that's what I would say. <laughs> right. That's, yeah. It only takes one person to follow your dream. That's right. That's a good one. Thank you so much, Dave.